Ow. My god, this song. It's so beautiful. It makes me feel so protected and safe and loved. Hey, buddy. Oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god. There has never been a video game that has made me feel the way I felt when I first played Dark Souls. My first exposure to the Souls-like genre. At the time, I didn't even know how to describe it. I knew I had a ton of fun overcoming the oppressive difficulty, but I still felt there was so much more that the game was offering, and I was doing a piss-poor job of finding it. I had to miss something, right? I mean, I walked through all these areas, fought all of these bosses, and I still don't know what the hell is happening. What the hell is happening? What was happening was I was playing a full-blown masterpiece. Dark Souls is considered one of the greatest video games of all time, and some even calling it the greatest video game of all time. There is something about this game that just draws you in, and even though you might get frustrated with the difficulty or not have any idea what in God's name is going on, you still want to keep pushing through, because the way the game is crafted, and the way the entire world of Lordran is laid out for the player, with its perfect interconnected level design, although some areas are better than others, on top of the fact that Dark Souls truly introduced the enchanting part of cryptic but enchanting storytelling. You do not want to put the controller down, and even though Demon Souls was the first in the series, Dark Souls did what Demon Souls did, cut out 98% of the bullshit, hey, I said 98, added that interconnected world that felt real, and just made the experience of playing hit harder than Will Smith, Unfortunately though, because of this, most of the time when the topic of Dark Souls comes up, people immediately flock to, it's very, very hard. Because I am hard, you will not like me. But boiling it down to just that diminishes what Dark Souls actually brought to the table. So when you hear something like, this is the Dark Souls of first person shooters, a lot of the time, not all of the time, but a lot of the time, it only checks one box. So, what are these boxes that Dark Souls so eloquently checks? And what about this game in particular, connected with so many people? And how did it truly establish from software as a force to be reckoned with in the gaming industry? Well, that's what I aim to answer, and that's why you're here. So strap in, boys and girls, and let's get down to business. Aside from the difficulty, the core elements to why Dark Souls appealed to so many people can be summed up with four key points. Points that would go on to define future Souls games as well. Gameplay, level design, bosses, and lore. Each form a cycle of dependency. Gameplay and combat has to feel satisfying and rewarding, and its core systems such as progression and currency need to make sense, just like any other video game. But the gameplay needs level design. Good mechanics don't mean jack shit if the levels are poorly designed and the enemies aren't properly balanced, especially in a Souls game. See Dark Souls 2. The levels need to look great, play well, and have a consistent theme. Enemy placement and design need to be properly tuned to be fair and make sense within the confines of the level, while also getting across certain lessons that the game wants to teach the player. But levels are of course nothing without their bosses. The pinnacle of the game's challenge. How well a boss is designed can either make or break a level. A level may be good, but the boss is not as good. And it can make a good area leave you feeling underwhelmed or vice versa and make a mediocre or bad area have some allure. Perfect two examples. Do you remember that the Duke's Archives is a pretty good area? Or do you think, oh, see this kind of an underwhelming boss? And the fight's not even in the area. That's how much it impacts your view of it. Now think of Darkroot Garden. Kind of a nothing area, some NPCs roaming around, but nothing to really write home about. Do you think that, or do you think, oh my god, it's Sif? prepare to cry. You see what I'm saying? Now, I'm not saying you can't think both, but one of those thoughts is going to prevail, and most of the time it's, who's the big bad boy I'm fighting at the end of this? Now, it would be great if the game had just these three, but what puts Souls games over the top and makes them masterpieces is the lore. Level design and bosses need to make sense within the confines of the overall story of the game, at least the parts it's peace feeding the player, and walking around in an area should feel like you're actually in a place of great significance. Every location, item, enemy, and boss need to tie into the overall lore of Dark Souls and other Souls games, so it adds extra weight to what the player is doing. But of course, that doesn't work if you don't have good gameplay, and the cycle continues. All four of these are critical to a Souls game success, and Dark Souls has it all.
Now we get into the nitty gritty of details. Now, I usually like to talk gameplay first since that's the most important thing, but Dark Souls is a special case. Because to understand the allure of Dark Souls and how it captured everyone's attention, you have to address the story and the storytelling that it presents the player. Like it or not, although most of us gamers are driven by how good the gameplay of a game is, there's also the attitude that gamers have, which is, all right, what am I doing here? What's the story? Which is absolutely something you have to address. In Demon Souls, it was easy to understand. Your task is to destroy all the demons and save Boletaria. But in Dark Souls, you're like, why am I ringing a bell? Well, there's a specific tactic that From Software implemented with its storytelling and world building, and it's real simple, and you might not think about it, but I'll explain why it makes Dark Souls so much more enticing. You're given the background of things in the opening cutscene, which explains how the world was once ruled by the ancient dragons, and how the dwellers below discovered fire and found soul within the flame, headed up by three important figures, the Lord of Sunlight, Gwyn, the Witch of Izalith, and the Daughters of Chaos, and Grave Lord Nido. It also explains how the fourth, the Furtive Pygmy, was forgotten, since it was never on the same level as the other three. With the power of the soul, they challenged and overthrew the dragons, becoming gods, and with the help of the dragon trader, Seath the Scaleless, established the thriving kingdom of Lordran. But then it explains that man is facing an eternal darkness as they've been branded with the dark sign, the undead curse. Cut to the Undead Asylum, where those that are undead are sent to live out the end of the world. Once you escape and make your way to Lordran, as you explore, it seems completely different than what was told to you. The place feels empty. Everyone's lost their minds, they keep attacking me. Everything's in ruins. What happened to that thriving kingdom we saw in the cutscene? What happened to Gwyn, the Witch of Izalith, Seath? How did this world go from seemingly the equivalent of Mount Olympus to the equivalent of walking into the wrong neighborhood? Presenting the player with the creation of point A, and now all of a sudden you're at point B? Your understandable reaction is, wait, how the hell did we get to point B? This would be like if Star Wars showed the height of the Jedi Order and then cut to the reign of the Empire. You'd be like, Wait, what happened here? Where's all the Jedi? But what makes this work is how we got to point B doesn't really matter to us right now. We don't need to know how all this happened to play the game, but it, along with our main purpose, is a cloud that's constantly hanging over us throughout the entire game. Speaking of our main purpose, well, we don't understand that either. We get broken out of the asylum by Oscar in an attempt to fulfill his family's prophecy. Regrettably, I have failed in my mission, but perhaps you can keep the torch lit. There is an old saying in my family, Thou who art undead art chosen, and thine exodus from the undead asylum maketh pilgrimage to the land of ancient lords. When thou ringeth the bell of awakening, the fate of the undead thou shalt know. So, what does that mean? Eh, I got no idea, but this place sucks, so let's get out of here. Even when you're brought to Firelink Shrine and are speaking to the crestfallen warrior, There are, actually, Two bells of awakening. Ring them both, and something happens. Brilliant, right? Not much to go on. But I have a feeling that won't stop you. So, off you go. It is why you came, isn't it? To this accursed land of the undead? You only have one thing on your mind. But why? What does this solve, exactly? The motivations behind what you're doing are incredibly vague. Hell, you don't even know what your true purpose is until a little less than halfway through the game. Now, constructing your narrative like this is a very ballsy move, because you risk your audience being completely turned off because of the confusion, and the difficulty doesn't exactly help things either. Why get my ass handed to me if I don't even know what it's for? This is where the gameplay, level design, and world design, and everything else comes into play, because the enjoyment you actually have playing the game coupled with the constant amount of questions you have, create this drive that makes you want to go deeper and deeper and figure everything out. Because of this, you as the player are like, wow, I'm getting killed, but I'm having a lot of fun doing it. And also, I really want to figure out why I have to ring these bells. And also, hey, I'm having a great time playing through this game. And you know what? I want to figure out how we got to point B. You see what I mean? Every aspect of Dark Souls builds upon each other. 
and the whys and hows are the first things that hit you when you start the game. And they follow you through whatever you do. And when you find your answers, everything about Dark Souls becomes stronger. And since the game is very stingy on telling you the details, you have to find the details yourself, which is where things such as item descriptions become vital to the player's overall knowledge, and some can even provide some good foreshadowing. Do not turn your back on the wily thieves or the wild dogs who serve the Capra Demon. Wait, what's a Capra Demon? Oh. But speaking of gameplay and level design, I think it's time we talk about it. Shall we? Like I said in the beginning, Dark Souls cut out 98% of the bullshit that Demon Souls had. No more world tendency, no more losing half your health, no more starting from the beginning of a level when you die. When you die in Dark Souls, you respawn, you are as you are, no change, same challenge. If you fail, get your ass up and go fail again. That's why the challenge became so renowned where Demon Souls faltered. It brought that same hard but fair difficulty with no strings attached. But for the love of God, the upgrade process. Please, please give me some more Titanite shards. Please, sir. I want some more. <laughs> but since we got this new interconnected world and no nexus to pick where we go next, we need to rest someplace when we get done looking like Grunt. Anybody got something to eat? So because of this, Dark Souls brought along the most monumental and iconic mechanic to the franchise. The bonfires. These are your best friends, your checkpoints, your safe havens throughout the game. Unlike Demon Souls, the bonfires are where you level up, so you don't have to travel back to a specific area in order to do so like in Demon Souls. It's also where you can do things like attune magic, change your covenant, repair your gear if you have the resources, restore your humanity, and through that, kindle bonfires so you can get more heals for your Estus flasks. Oh yeah, did I mention we went from drugs to alcohol? At the start of the game, you're given your Estus Flask, which is your only method of healing. Each time you rest at a bonfire, it refills to a minimum of five uses, depending on how much you kindled the bonfire. So no more farming for healing items anymore. You can refill and get on with your life. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a reason why the Estus Flask is so much more preferred than the item system that Demon Souls or Bloodborne had. Because it's convenient. And that's all there is to it. And you can find Firekeeper Souls throughout the game too that raises the amount of health the Estus recovers. Very important PSA, do not use the Firekeeper Souls. Take them to a Firekeeper. I repeat, do not use them. The game also brought back summoning, but now instead of only being able to summon real people, Dark Souls included the option to summon NPCs, so you didn't need an internet connection in order to get help. However, this is the game that completely turned me off to summoning, because it was essentially a skip fight token. Because these NPCs absolutely take over. Just look how Solaire melts the Bell Gargoyles in under 30 seconds. And I summon Mildred for the Quaylog fight, and I mean, look at this. I'm dicking around over here emoting while Quaylog is completely focused on Mildred. Yeah, you could say the NPC summons were a little much. Speaking of summoning, funny story. So I got invaded in the undead burg under the bridge. I lied in wait for my invader to make his way to me. Once he showed up, we emoted as per tradition. But as I started the fight, anticipating he was going to attack, he dropped some sunlight medals, almost like a peace offering. And then, once I realized what was happening, I apologized to him in the only way I knew how. And then to my absolute shock, he dropped the Silver Knight armor set and the Mask of the Father, which raises your equipment load. You don't get this stuff until the mid game and this dude was giving it to me in the second area of the game. And then he was gone. I couldn't believe it. This is among the most wholesome moments I've ever experienced as a gamer. I felt so horrible that I attacked this guy. So whenever you see me in this video wearing the Silver Knight armor and the Mask of the Father, that's from this guy, D-Doc. Hey, D-Doc, wherever you are, man, thank you for your jolly cooperation. It helped a lot. Moving on. Now, when it comes to level design and the world building, Dark Souls is the pinnacle of the industry. The interconnected world of Lordran is a true work of art and something that has never been matched in gaming, even by other games in the series. Maybe Bloodborne, but that's it. For starters, every level of the game looks unique with areas that invoke a certain feeling. Wonder and magnificence, terror and fear, or just plain old grandiosity. This is helped out immensely by the lack of music in the game, except for some key areas. This is a perfect design choice, just like it was in Demon Souls, because it forces the player to take in the sights and sounds around them. You feel like you yourself are actually walking around in a living, breathing world. 
But unlike Demon Souls, there's actually three other areas besides the hub area where you hear music. The Daughters of Chaos Bonfire, the Chamber of the Princess, and Ash Lake. Each of these areas along with Firelink Shrine have significant lore implications. And when you hear music in these areas, it makes it feel that much more significant since most of the time all you hear is your armor clanking as you walk. Dark Souls made the world of Lordran feel real and every time you're in an area, you'll most likely be able to also see a few other places in the world that you'll eventually find yourself in, which is so damn cool. The coolest low-key moment is on my first playthrough when beating the Bell Gargoyles and then actually taking the time to look up and see the Duke's archives all the way up there. What is that? And that is what makes the world of Lordran so enchanting. Because when you're able to grasp the scale of the world, look at a place, get to that place, and then look back at where you came from, that is so freaking awesome. While I wouldn't classify Dark Souls as a typical open world game, certainly not to the extent of games like Elden Ring, Breath of the Wild, and Red Dead Redemption, it utilizes this technique so much better than most open world games. But this is where the interconnectivity of the map shines, because everything seamlessly blends into one another, and once you start looping back into other areas, Whee! That moment where you take the lift down from the undead parish and wind up back in Firelink Shrine, or opening up the Watchtower basement in Darkroot Basin and- You gonna do something or just stand there and bleed? This all feels so damn satisfying because no area feels like it's just off in the middle of nowhere. And once you get to that area that you've already been to, that sense of familiarity kicks in and offers another sense of relief. Now from a gameplay perspective, Dark Souls utilizes its level design perfectly. You're not forced to go anywhere at a specific time. Now obviously you need to go to specific places to progress the game, but you're not put on rail and told where to go. You figure it out yourself, and you get there when you get there. Since Dark Souls is vague with its storytelling, the game tells you where to go through its level design. For example, raise your hand if this happened to you. Catacombs. You know exactly what I'm talking about. The first place you ventured to upon landing in Firelink Shrine. Uh, but, but there's one problem. Uh, you proceeded to get turned into minced meat. Oh my god, is the game really this hard? I can't even do anything to these guys. No. The game is not this hard. What this is, is from software's method of communicating to the player. Hey buddy, you're not supposed to go this way, because not only does every one of their attacks take almost half your health, but you barely put a dent in them when you attack. You try running past them, and then you realize there's also giant skeletons, meaning those normal boys back there, they're the main enemy of this area. So, uh... Yeah, I'm gonna take the hint and leave. So, what's next? All right, you got this ramp that goes down this way. Take the elevator down. Ooh, spooky. Oh, what do you know? We got ourselves some ghosts. Who are you gonna call? Oh, wait, I can't hit them. I can't hit them. I, I can't hit, what, what the hell do I do? Ah! All right, well, this isn't the right way. So then you have the last area, the ramp that leads to the undead burg. And well, would you look at that? I can actually kill these enemies. You see what I mean? From Software tells you exactly where you can and cannot go strictly through gameplay, through trial and error. And while that might be annoying to some, it's not really that bad, because you're very early on in the game and you don't really lose anything when you die. Through trial and error, you can figure out which direction is the right one, and the first half of the game executes this perfectly. Let's talk about the levels themselves. Each one feels unique and challenging in their own right for where you are in the game. For starters, say hello to your hub area. Firelink Shrine. Ah, home sweet home. When thinking about Firelink Shrine, I had this question in my mind. There's nothing you can really do there, aside from purchasing some spells and miracles. The blacksmith is in another area, you can level up at any bonfire, so why do we hold Firelink Shrine in such high regard? Well, there's two answers, atmosphere and interconnectivity. I truly think that to this day, there has not been a single hub area that has captured the atmosphere that Firelink Shrine has. All of the others have had their own comforting atmosphere, but Firelink Shrine just truly feels like home. Whether that's because of the song or the aesthetic, I don't know. But every time you walk into the shrine, it feels like you just got home after a shitty day of work. Ah, what a day. Finally time to relax. Ah, nice and toasty in here. Hey, I think grandma made cookies. And the other part that establishes the feeling of Firelink Shrine is the fact that you first arrive there after leaving the Undead Asylum. You don't show up after you've been killed for the first time. You don't warp there because you need to meet some people. It feels like this is your reward after escaping your captivity. Here's your relief. 
enjoy it while you can, because you got some bells to ring. The second factor is interconnectivity. Just like the world of Lordran itself, Firelink Shrine connects to five different areas of the map. Undead Asylum, the Undead Burg, the Undead Parish, New Londo Ruins, and the Catacombs. So the area acts like a level select screen the way the Nexus did without actually having a level select screen. And you have the Undead Parish that loops back into Firelink Shrine by the time you've already had enough of that place. That feeling I got when I first discovered this Nothing like it. The first hour to two hours really cements Firelink Shrine as a true safe haven, without needing to have a lot of resources or NPCs that stay there the whole time, although they do come and go. In terms of the true areas, the Undead Burg and the Undead Parish are perfect first levels, because they give you a taste of what you're going to face throughout the game. The Hollows are easy to kill, but if you let your guard down or dick around, you can get brought back down to Earth real quick. It also has... Nope. It also introduces dragons that do exactly what you think they do. The Depths introduces you to ailments as you deal with giant rats that can poison you and... Oh yeah, these guys. It also teaches you that the path ahead won't be as obvious as you have to drop down this hole in the labyrinth to get to the boss. Great, how much time did I waste jumping over this thing? We then arrive at everyone's favorite place in Lordran, a place of peace and tranquility where you can walk around for hours with your loved ones and not get bored. A perfect place for family out of- yeah, just kidding, it's Blighttown. Now, I played the remastered edition, so I never got to experience the frame rate drops that the original had, but for everyone that craps on this area, you're wrong. Blighttown is an amazing level. Well, I'm not saying I'd like to build a summer home here, but the trees are actually quite lovely. It's an area that shows the player that not only will the enemies be hostile, but the world will be too, the same way the Valley of Defilement did it in Demon's Souls. And it's not really so bad to walk through once you get your bearings, aside from these assholes. Really love how they put a Firekeeper soul right in the middle of a literal firing squad. G -g Great job, guys. Great decision. G -g Phenomenal. 10 out of good. Yeah, it's annoying that you have to get poisoned before you either get to Quaylog's Domain or the Great Hollow, but you get enough purple moss clumps throughout the level to counteract this, and by this point, you should have enough poison resistance built up to where when you get poisoned, it doesn't melt you immediately. Yeah, it does make for restricted exploration since it slows you down, but again, this is the game showing you that not every level will be safe to explore. Sometimes you just gotta get in, do your business, and get out. And Blight Town illustrates this perfectly. Taking a detour for the main areas, I've got to dedicate some time in this video to talk about one of the most mesmerizing areas that From Software has ever created, Ash Lake. Yeah, this place has nothing really to offer gameplay-wise, but I don't care. The moment you step out into Ash Lake is a moment that you yourself will never forget. Instantly getting hit with that. Okay, I'll stop now. The first time I walked out onto the beach, I was like, oh my god, what is this place? Are those all trees? How far down do these go? Wow, why does this music hit so hard? Wait a minute, is that a Hydra? I want more fan art of this thing pronto. Get on it, this thing doesn't get enough love. But sometimes, you just want to deal with him later. But don't get too comfortable, because these clams can actually do some damage if you're not careful enough. I've been in six- What the fuck?! He can jump?! How? How can a sea monster jump? What's the logic in that? No, 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 that's not happening. This is not happening. This is not happening. Dude, I I'm sorry I killed your cousin. I, I had to get to the DLC. Please leave me alone. While Ash Lake is a very long hallway, it's the coolest looking hallway ever. And what's at the end of that hallway? Well, just the last surviving ancient dragon in Lordran. How's that for stumbling onto important lore? Speaking of hostile world, you met my friend Sen? Yeah, he's got a nice little place next to the church. He's inviting us over for the UFC pay-per-view. Hey Sen, do you know where the bath- Sen, your house sucks. If Blighttown didn't hammer into your brain that the world can be hostile, Sen's fortress is here to make it obvious. This is the toughest challenge you face yet because everything in this level is out to kill you. Man serpents, swinging pendulums, giant boulders, giants throwing giant boulders, you step on a floor plate, 
I'm not even gonna play around this. Luke, it's 8.45, wake up and get a job. All right, all right, I'm up, dad. Say hello to Mimics. All of this shit getting thrown at you never allows you to relax because something is always around every corner waiting to take you down. I mean, really, who thought it was a good idea to teach snakes how to use lightning? And when you overcome these trials, you feel like an absolute champ. And since you've overcome these trials, it's time to graduate, buddy. Welcome to An Orlando. The City of the Gods. Mucking through all the hostile and ruinous areas in the game so far, only to fly up and see a shining city on a hill is the most jaw-dropping visual in the entire game. Especially since you've seen the wall throughout your time in Undead Burg and Parish, and you've been wondering what's up there, and when I first saw this, I was floored. You definitely would have taken fall damage here, by the way. I'm just gonna say it, Anor Orlando was the best area in Souls history. All-encompassing Souls and Souls-like history. And it's not even close. Because this is peak from software. This is by far the most balanced and well-designed area in the game. The aesthetic of the structures you're in, even before you get to the cathedral, make you feel like such an insignificant piece of shit. Your kind clearly are not allowed here. And the enemies make you feel this way too. Look how big we are, and look at you. You're absolutely nothing. Ow, my leg! And it offers a little foreshadowing for what's to come. Looking for more things to do in the city? Come visit the N. Orlando Art Gallery, featuring our wonderful masterpiece, of Ariamis. We've also beefed up our security because I'll be damned if another climate activist glues their hands to one more goddamn painting! Finally, I'm here. I can fulfill my lifelong dream of permanently attaching myself to a magnificent work of art in the name of environmentalism. With this step, the planet will be one step closer to the utopia I dream of. We shall shepherd it- Whoa, whoa, what? What? Wait, what's happening? What? Ah! Ah! Mommy! Dormass. It also offers some additional exploration too. Free! You also got these messenger bats that somehow fall to their death. Don't ask. But what if I told you, you haven't seen anything yet? Welcome to the An Orlando Archery Club, the greatest archery club in all of Lordran. Helping to create the perfect shot since the dawn of the first flame, our members don't just use any old arrows, we pride ourselves on using great arrows. Great enough for all tasks, big or small. Watch as our Season Rewards members effortlessly eliminate those pesky undead solicitors. And did we mention that you'll never run out of arrows? Never! Not even close! How do we do it? See for yourself! Seasonal registration is currently open with 25% off your first four months. Join today and you can strengthen your body and mind to make that perfect shot and protect that amazing chest ahead. And Orlando Archery Club. Just try to get by. Can we just take a second to talk about one of the coolest enemies in all of gaming? The Silver and Black Knights are the epitome of badassery, Gwyn's faithful soldiers. When you encounter one of these boys throughout Lordram, you immediately snap to attention and get serious. Their attacks have punishing power and the Black Knights can pull out special moves that absolutely flatline you. I also appreciate how there's variation between the knights. Not everyone is just confined to one weapon. You got swords, spears, great swords, great axes, and glaives. And each knight has a shield, so if you're unfortunate enough to get blocked, you better make sure you got enough stamina to get your ass out of there quick. And always, ALWAYS go for backstabs. An Orlando is the climax of the game, and the definitive halfway point for the game. But hey, the game is so far has just been great, and now I have more levels to explore? What other great things does Dark Souls possibly have in store for me? It can only get better from here, right? Yeah, about that. Dark Souls has been called a tale of two halves, and the first half up to Anor Orlando is just design perfection, no two ways about it. But as soon as you get the Lord Vessel and unlock the final areas where the Lords are, I'm not gonna say it falls off a cliff, but it definitely stumbles. Now that's not to say the last four areas are all bad, but overall, where the first half of the game was so fine-tuned and balanced with great level design, the design of the latter half is more of a mixed bag, mainly because some levels were just straight up rushed, or because the difficulty plateaus since you now have more options on what order to go to fight the lords. Like I said earlier, I think the Duke's Archives is a pretty good level. Having to make your way out of this maze-like library while dealing with crystallized soldiers and cracked up sorcerers it's pretty fun. And I don't care what anyone says, this initial lead up is awesome. The wall's slowly getting more crystallized until... Oh my god, it's Seath. 
It's, it's actually him. Wait, I, I can't get near this guy. I can't get near him. Dude, what do I... What do I do? Oh my god, someone please help me. How do I beat... Ah! Side note, you can actually just leave this room. And I even like New Londo Ruins, even though it's got some things I wouldn't agree with, but its atmosphere and aesthetic are perfect. It's also where the power of item descriptions are fully on display. When we look at the description for the keys to the ruins and the seal, the legends speak of a terrible dark which was sealed away. And also, the sealers flooded New Londo to banish the dark wraiths and the four kings. This agonizing decision was made with the realization that countless lives and the robust culture of the city would be lost. So, if these things were so bad that they flooded their entire city and killed the entire population just to contain them, what exactly am I walking into here? We drain the water, which somehow doesn't wash these drakes away, we take the elevator down, and then we see it. The bodies. The piles of the decrepit remains of those who once populated this once robust city. And then you lay eyes on your welcome party. Say hello to the Dark Wraiths, who are um, a little out of practice. This is what I meant when I said the difficulty plateaus, because it feels like the Dark Wraiths were supposed to be much harder than this, but the developers didn't have enough time to really expand and make them more complex. You're so strong at this point that you absolutely run through them like they're nothing. It doesn't really depict them as something so dangerous that they had to be sealed away. It's like, we killed our entire city for this? Bro, you should've just sent me in. You guys never hear of the backstab? But the other two levels are where things really get bad. The Tomb of the Giants and Lost Isolith. There's been much debate about which one is worse. And as the judge, jury, and executioner at this time, it's Tomb of the Giants. You're basically in the dark for the entire level, which is not bad because you can get a skull lantern. There's some other methods, but this is what most people do. This is not a problem. However, what is a problem is these things. Since the lantern has to replace your shield and these guys go berserk on you, you have no idea when these guys are going to attack until you right up against them. And by then, I hope you're in the mood for an ass pounding. Not to mention the Black Knight that of course has to blend in. Hey guys, look, I found John Cena and it really is true. I can't see him. Finally, Lost Isolith. This area was developed by Xbox. And by that, I mean it's not finished. Despite that, however, I don't hate Lost Isolith because you know how I view Lost Isolith? A straight line. You have a straight path to the boss, and the line itself is pretty harmless. But everything else around it sucks. And now I'm done talking about it. But overall, despite the latter half blunders, the level design that Dark Souls introduces provides the perfect measure of teaching and wonder. And through all of the challenges the levels introduce, and the journey that you take through each, Lordran will amaze you, intimidate you, even scare you, but most importantly, make a man out of you, whether you like it or not. But of course, Levels are nothing without one special aspect. You know what it is. Say it with me. The boss, baby. Dark Souls has a much larger variety of bosses compared to Demon Souls. Some are all-time greats, some are spectacles, some got in through affirmative action, but all in all, when you take the entire lineup into account, it's a definite upgrade from the first game. However, when actually looking at each boss in the game individually, and after playing every Souls game, the lineup is actually somewhat of a mixed bag when you think about it. I mean, it's literally down the middle for me. There's 26 bosses in the game. 13 of them I would say are good, 13 are mediocre to bad. And if you take the DLC bosses out of there, the scale shifts to the latter. But even though a lot don't really hit the nail on the head, they still have cool designs and have something to offer. So for the most part, Dark Souls bosses serve their purpose, providing an interesting challenge for the player to overcome, which is what we all want in the first place. Now for now, we're going to focus on the base game. I'm going to do a separate video on the DLC depending on how long this runs, which as of right now looks like it's a lot. Dark Souls bosses mostly ditch the gimmicks found in Demon Souls, as a large majority of the bosses are now just straightforward tests of your reaction time, with glitz and glamour to accompany it. There's still gimmicks like Gwyn Priscilla, and Pinwheel, but the majority of the time, the boss will be pressing the attack, now do something about it. There's a couple I want to highlight, both good and bad, because I got words for some of these. But before that, I'm sorry guys, uh, I have something I gotta admit. I died to Pinwheel on my first ever attempt. What did you say? What the fuck did you just say? God, I feel disgusting just remembering that. But first, let's talk some good. The Asylum Demon, the first boss you encounter in the Undead Asylum, and the guy that yeeted Oscar through the roof. You'll pay for that, you fat bastard. 
Uh, how, how do I, how, how, how? We all remember this. Can't damage him. You have no idea what to do. But then all of a sudden, you notice an exit and you take it. This is Dark Souls telling the player that sometimes there will be fights that you can't win. So when in doubt, retreat and regroup. You then get your weapon and discover the truly wonderful mechanic of plunging attacks. <laughs> How you doing, buddy? Oh, the weather's nice up here. What are you gonna do? You'll never reach me. Holy shit! Not hard, but a perfect first boss that sets the tone of Dark Souls. Speaking of setting the tone, we need a mechanism to separate the boys from the men. And it turns out, I know a guy. Actually, two guys. You might know them, the Bell Gargoyles. It's a treat to go on YouTube and look up videos of streamers fighting the Bell Gargoyles for the first time because every one of them have the exact same reactions. Nice. Whoa, why is there two? Why is there two? Why is there two? <laughs> Get the fuck out of here, bro, are you serious? <laughs> this is the second boss of the game. And you're already giving me two? And it's just priceless, because it's something we all felt, too. Whoa, what the? There's two of them? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, the... Oh, are you serious? You're serious? Oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. No. From Software took the Maneaters fight in Demon Souls, cleaned up the AI, and put it right at the start of Dark Souls. Because this game said... We are not playing around. We're gonna throw you right into the deep end. You're either gonna sink or you're gonna swim. And what's great about this is that each gargoyle individually isn't that hard to deal with. It's just the fact that there's two. And first time players aren't thinking this early game boss is gonna give them problems, but hey, they're getting through it. W wait, there's a second? There's a sec- How is there a second? It's also a fight that teaches you that when in doubt, when you're outnumbered, hey, just someone, someone to help you. How you doing, son bro? Hey, you thought Anne Orlando was great already? I never even mentioned the best part. Ah, God, what an amazing chest. Uh, who? Smo, who's this maidenless runt you let in? I didn't let him in, he just walked in. Ah, uh, no matter. It seems we'll just have to dispose of him. <laughs> Say hello to Ornstein and Smo, one of the greatest boss fights ever created, period. Yeah, you thought the duos were done with the Bell Gargoyles, huh? Nah, we got one more, and this time we're up front about it. On top of the sheer intimidation these guys give the player, Ornstein and Smo is an all-time great because even though they're a duo boss in a game centered around punishing difficulty, they complement each other perfectly so it's not just two strong enemies out of sync attacking you, so it turns into bullshit. Oh, hey, Godskin Duo. These two were designed to be fought in a duo fight because it centers around separating them so you can whittle one's health down, but you always have to be on your toes because you know the other one is following behind. Their attacks are simple and easy to dodge, but just like the gargoyles, the challenge is that there's two, and unlike the gargoyles, two completely different movesets with different speeds. Ornstein's speed will vary between walking kinda slow and You're too slow! While Smo keeps a steady pace even with his charge attack. But what makes this work are the pillars in the room. So you have some obstacles for the two to work around so it's not just a wide open plane with nothing to help you slow them down. Coupled with the music, this fight is just a pure adrenaline rush. And that's before you take one out. Yeah, you thought it would be simple. Nah, this is what we call the climax and Dark Souls is not letting you go without a show. What I love about this is that you instantly get a grasp on both their personalities and not a single word of dialogue is spoken at any time. This is how you do show, don't tell. You know what? I'm not gonna talk about these guys anymore. You're all gonna go play it. Everybody, right now, go boot up Dark Souls, make your way to Anne Orlando, and fight these guys yourself. If you don't have it, buy it. Let's pour one out for these boys because it kind of goes downhill from here. Now we get to the Lord fights, the big boys. And let me tell you something, I'm spending some time giving love to one of the most underappreciated bosses in the entire series, the Four Kings. I've seen the absolute disrespect thrown these guys way, and you know what? That shit stops here. This fight is awesome. Yeah, it's a DPS check, but it's the best DPS check ever made. The entire fight depends on you killing one king before another one shows up and joins him. And if you're too slow, you could be dealing with all four at once, although I've never gotten to that point. And because of the pitch black, you have no idea how close they actually are to you. 
which messes with you much more than you would think. But what's great about this is that it doesn't become a gang fight when another shows up. Rather, the others sit back and launch these homing energy blasts at you. Also, these swords are massive, and I don't know how close he is to dodge this grab. And oh shit, he's gonna blow! Hello there. And that's after the amazing intro to the fight. Taking that long drop into the abyss, this plane of just nothing but black. A few seconds go by, you see the health bar come up and the songs start playing. You look around wondering where they are until you see this silver object just charging at you. There's no health coming. There's no escaping. It's you and these massive wraiths in the void. And it doesn't end until one of you is dead. The Four Kings are the best boss in the endgame, and one of the best bosses in the entire series. And I will die on that hill. Nito and Seath? Not so much. I still think Nito was a good boss, and a cool boss, but his difficulty mostly revolves around the skeletons that he summons. He himself is pretty easy to kill. I mean, you can literally roll under him and just kill him from the inside. That's not even mentioning the fact that you actually have to drop into his arena and take a huge chunk of fall damage. Like, why was this necessary? Also, his first move is a dick stab. Seath is just like, dodging? What's that? Oh, oh no, please, please stop, please. You got any other moves besides this? Uh, oh well, I guess it makes this clip much more relevant. How's it feel, Seath, to be a bitch? God forbid you get cursed by this thing or else back through the crystal cave you go. Also, this arena is way too small for him. He clips through the walls like every three seconds. But you know what, guys? Credit to Nito and Seath. At least, they're boss fights. Unlike something else. You know what guys, I'm not the first person to talk about Dark Souls, and I certainly won't be the last. So everything that could possibly be said about this thing has already been said. But you know what? One day I'm gonna meet God. And when he inquires on why I didn't talk about the beta chaos in my Dark Souls video, and I say it's because other people have already done it, It may not be a sufficient reply. If Lost Isolith was made by Xbox, then this thing was made by Bethesda because it was not playtested before release. It's okay though, I love roleplaying as a breadcrumb at the dinner table. And you wanna make a boss fight based purely on luck? Well then call me Shea Cormac, because I make my own luck. But I, I don't think it's working. <laughs> you know it's bad when you approach a boss fight with the attitude of, all right, I'm losing these souls. <laughs> no nothing I can do about that. Enough breath spent on this thing. The last thing I'll say, I think the Witch of Isolith should get another chance at having a boss fight based on her because she's prominent enough and this shouldn't be the last thing we remember her by. Don't let these last few fool you though. Dark Souls bosses are overall a pretty great time, and that's before you get to the DLC. Despite the mixed bag in the base game, there's no doubt that the boss fights are the highlight of Dark Souls, and that's what sticks with you long after you finish the game. Dark Souls has much more to offer besides just pure gameplay components. It also has an amazing cast of NPCs and that enchanting lore that I touched on earlier. And since you're completely alone on your journey, encountering one of these guys in the barren world offers an instant connection because there's other undead that are all after the same fulfillment that you are. Most are good, others are, uh... A little sus. But all of them have something to offer you, either through world building or simply rooting for us and cheering us up. Just like the volunteers at Fantastic, and speaking to some might actually nab you a little bit of helpful info. The cursed ghosts of New Londo are formidable foes. To face them, you will require special arms or a cursed body. Speaking of cheering us up, it's time we pay respects to two of the greatest NPCs I've ever seen in a video game. Solaire and Siegmeier. You wanna know why these guys are so famous? You wanna know why these guys are so beloved by everybody who's played Dark Souls? Because they're upbeat, comforting, and adventurous. There you are. I'll be heading down below shortly. There's nothing worthwhile up above. No worries. Adventuring is my life. I'm prepared for the worst. <laughs> In the cruel world of Lordran, where everyone has seemingly turned into bloodthirsty psychopaths, having characters that are completely pure with not a bad bone in their body is just so damn comforting. You really are fond of chatting with me, aren't you? If I didn't know better, I'd think you had feelings for me. Oh no, dear me, pretend you didn't hear that. <laughs> 
You wanna know why there's so much fan art of both these guys drinking by the bonfire? It's because they're the type of guys that you would want to sit and have a drink with after you get done killing a giant demon. Not to mention Solaire is also where we get the white soapstone and are able to engage in jolly cooperation. Not to mention all the NPCs have their own storylines for themselves, some of which are just great, like Quailana, who was the only daughter of Chaos to escape Isolith unscathed when the Flame of Chaos mutated the rest of her family. If you're powerful enough in Pyromancy, she takes you on as her apprentice, and as you buy more upgrades from her, she tells you that she doesn't have the courage to face her family alone anymore. So she then asks you to go kill her mother the Witch of Izalith, who has become the Bed of Chaos. So basically, she's telling me to kill myself, and I don't take too kindly to that. I don't know, it feels kind of nice to help put her at ease with her family problems. Speaking of family problems, the entire Daughters of Chaos lore and storytelling is also pretty great. Most, if not all, players consider Artorias and Sif's storyline to be the most tragic, and believe me, it is. But god, nobody talks about Quelog and the Fair Lady. You want to talk about tragic irony, Quaylock is of course standing between you and the second Bell of Awakening, and... Oh, oh, oh yeah! You fight and kill her, but then you stumble upon her sister, the second Daughter of Chaos, also known as the Fair Lady, and... Uh... This is awkward. Yeah, it turns out the Fair Lady is dying because she absorbed a sickness known as Blight Pus. Gee, I wonder where that came from. And Quelog was stealing humanity so she could heal her, so she set up her abode near the Bell of Awakening because she knew there would be a constant supply of humanity since undead have to come this way to ring the bell. And, uh, I just killed a dying woman's caretaker. I mean, once again, she struck first, I'm just the empire that strikes back, but that sickness also made her blind. So when you have the witch's ring and you're able to converse with her, she thinks you're Quelog. And oh my god, this voice acting. Quelog, my day sister, the ex, it hurts. They've gone still. I am afraid it may be too late. I am so sorry, dear sister. I'll be fine. I have you, dear sister. Charlie Cameron. Phenomenal job. I feel almost obligated to join this covenant. The good thing is, once you give her 50 humanity, she stops feeling pain. Shut up and take my humanity. It also levels you up to Covenant Level 3, which is a surprise tool that will help us later. The song here also does wonders for the mood. There's no real storyline for this, like with other NPCs, but my god, is it a gut punch. Finally with this, we have the last great part. Ceaseless Discharge, the only son of the Witch of Izalith. Yeah... This guy got the worst of it. Now, I am not about to sit here and say that this is a good boss. I am not dumb enough to say that. The mechanics of this thing are just, just not there. You wanna know how you beat him? He's as clumsy as he is stupid. But what if I told you... That's the point. When you get the orange charred ring from the centipede demon, it states that his sores were inflamed by lava from birth. His witch sisters gave him this special ring, but the fool that he is, he readily dropped it. The fool that he is, the lore states it. He's an idiot. You're an idiot. So when he goes to jump towards you, he doesn't realize that he'll fall to his death. It also doesn't help that he doesn't fight you until you pick up the robes of Quailana, who he thinks is dead. So he's so preoccupied with recovering his sister's memory, but the fool that he is, he gets dropped readily. So you know what? Ceaseless discharge. Your fight sucks. But you know what? I respect it. But the most important concept that Dark Souls explores through not only its lore, but through its gameplay, is the concept of hollowing. A phenomenon that is treated as something that is worse than death in the eyes of the undead. Going hollow happens when one loses their purpose, hope, and meaning, and succumbs to their worst feelings. In the case of us, the undead, since we're branded with the dark sign, we are linked to the fire, which means as long as it burns, we can never truly die. Sounds great, right? Eternal life? Unlimited chances to find our purpose? But no, this is Dark Souls, and every soul has its dark. The amount of times you die in this game leaves you feeling lost and hopeless. How can I possibly get past this boss? I can't beat them. I just can't beat him. And that attitude, that I just can't beat him, is the first step. The next step 
is quitting, giving up, losing your will to go forward. Only then will you truly become hollow. Dark Souls finds a way to connect its gameplay mechanics with its lore and manages to tie in a message about perseverance. Because hollowing is essentially this game's version of depression and every character in the game knows about it and is terrified by it. It's safe here. Can't bear the thought of going hollow out there. But because they all know the extent of hollowing, they don't want to see anyone succumb to that fate. So they constantly give you moral support, tell you to push through your problems and keep going. Be safe, friend. Don't you dare go hollow. Whatever you do, do not crack and go hollow. Lest my time spent on you be wasted. Go and get yourself killed. Neither of us want to see you go hollow. Oh, hello. Terrific to see us both in one piece. And pray that you never go hollow. Them saying, don't go hollow, is essentially the game telling you, don't give up, don't quit. Trust me, the reward will be better than you ever thought. What? The concept of hollowing depicts depression so well and hammers it home with its gameplay in such a brutal and interesting way that I kid you not, Dark Souls has actually helped people with their real life depression. I don't think you know how hard that is to pull off, but unfortunately, the NPCs aren't quite so lucky. The flip side of Dark Souls is that for these guys, there are no happy endings. Every single one ends up going hollow or insane. There are no happy endings because it's not just dying a lot that makes you go hollow. It's your purpose in life, which everyone has. And if you can't fulfill it, then you feel like all is lost. Even your bros, the ones with the most upbeat, and positive outlooks. Yeah, remember when I said that this was a surprise tool that will help us later? Yeah, I forgot to use it. No! No! Psych, I actually did. Even then, it doesn't really feel good because, yeah, you saved Solaire from going mad, but this man's clearly falling into despair. Even though you won't see it, this man is eventually going to go hollow. Or, uh, Siegmeier who just wants a taste of adventure, but is never able to. I gotta admit, I never completed this quest because of this f***ing god-awful section here, but he eventually goes hollow at Ash Lake and is forced to be put down by his own daughter. And you know what the worst part of this is? It's all your fault. This man wanted to live the life of a hero, but at every turn, you step in and steal the spotlight from him. Yeah, you might think you're helping him out, but all you're doing is making him feel more and more inadequate. I can't go five minutes without needing help from this guy. How can I be a true adventurer if I can't even do anything myself? It's heartbreaking when you realize it, and it cements hollowing as a truly dangerous force. But while all the others fail, you will rise up. Because after all, you are the chosen undead. So don't get yourself killed. Neither of us want to see you go hollow. With everything that it does, Dark Souls truly cements itself as one of the best games ever created. Its influence that it has had not only on the gaming industry, but on people as well, is something that only a few other games can even think about claiming. And despite its falters in the late game, you don't even care. Because all the other equity that it builds up throughout the runtime, that's so good it doesn't diminish anything that you're feeling or experiencing. It's a game you want to experience again and again. A game where you want to know more so you look up lore channels like Vati Vidya. And it's a game that gives you that feeling that when all seems lost, there is always a way out. A way to push through. A way to get good. And that is how Dark Souls became legendary. Yeah, this is just a formality, isn't it? Take a wild guess what score it gets. Yep. <laughs>